Cold app. All right. Sorry, everyone, for the technical difficulties. I'm just trying to start the slideshow. Okay. So good afternoon. My name is Sawyer Judge. Um, inevitably, after lunch, we're a quarter past two. You're probably all starting to get that follow lunch sleepiness. So I promise I'm going to make this presentation as engaging as I possibly can. Today, I will be presenting on the Wargaming Guild, how the nature of a craft, of a discipline impacts its craft and whether it matters. And this is the title of my master's thesis at Georgetown University. Um, and at this time, before I really delve into it, I just want to remind everyone that this work doesn't represent um, any of the institutions that I'm associated with. It is my own views and the personal academic work of myself. So a little bit about me. I just started as an associate research analyst at the Center for Naval Analysis in the Operational Warfighting Division. I am an amateur war game designer. The game you're looking at on the right hand side of your screen was a um, operational educational level war game that I created in Sebastian Bay's Georgetown class and had the pleasure of presenting to the Krulak Center. Um, at Georgetown University, I got both degrees, undergrad and masters, um, spent a lot of fantastic time there. And I also was recently appointed as a War Game Design and Research Fellow for the United States Naval Academy. So what I think is really important to highlight, first of all, is just how excited I am to present this work. As Matt alluded to, this is sort of a topic that underscores all of the undergoing conversations at Connections, and that's intentional. Because my first Connections conference was last summer at Carlisle. And I went to that conference, I was an intern with CNA at the time, and I went with the intention of trying to figure out what the heck I was going to write my thesis on. And I knew that I wanted to touch on wargaming, but I wanted it to be something that was useful to the community because I really cared about the community and I was trying to learn about the community at the time. So I thought it would sort of be beneficial for not only the community, but myself as well. Um, and from this, you know, that experience of connections, I started to pick up this, this, you know, different references. Oh, well, the art and science of wargaming. Oh, well, it's an art. Oh, it's a science. It's an art with science in it. And it left me wondering, well, which is it really? Is it really both? Um, and so I embarked on this academic journey. So I wanted to present as well um, this lovely poem. Um, this poem I found in my literature research. Um, it's a poem by an American painter inspired by an expressionist. So talk about an overlap of disciplines, but if you'll take a minute to look at it, the reason I included it, and I included it at the beginning of my thesis as well, is because research and art do seem to hold hands. Both create new questions, um, but they have different approaches to it. Um, is it deduction? Is it intuition? How do you get there? And, and that is something that I hope that you are grappling with as I move forward into my study. And as a basic outline of what I'm going to cover today, I'm going to begin with sort of the basics of the project itself, how I went about studying this, uh, the issue that the Guild faces, um, what is it that this problem really looks like in the literature, a theoretical discussion of art and science, what are art and science really, um, followed by a cross-examination results by traits of arts and science and by standards of procedure. And finally, with some lasting implications that I hope will spark discussion. So to start, I called the Wargaming community the Wargaming Guild. And this is not my term. Um, there are lots of references to it in literature, but I wanted to put here um, Rubel's excellent description of wargaming as a craft from the epistemology of wargame design. I thought that this really captured the essence, and you can see I have some medieval guild <laughs> um, insignias here on the slide, but it, you know, it, it is actually very accurate that we operate as a guild. I think that a lot of people can see this in their experience. You have professionals who are capturing res their respective practices and beliefs, and then they're handing them down to their protege, and you can almost see the separation of many guilds and the different places that produce war games, different standards of practice, it's kind of free flowing and it's not coming from something as rigid as perhaps the scientific method. It's sort of organic and it also is around the production of a product that resembles a craft. And I think that that understanding, sort of if this were an, eth if this were an ethnography, if this were an ethnographic study, I could have gone about this by interviewing everyone in the community 
and trying to compile different perspectives and do sort of like a, the guild exposed. Um, that wasn't what I did in this study because I was trying to get at the really basic, is it an art or a science? But I think that it's valuable to understand what the community looks like because it affects the, qual the quality of the community affects the craft that they produce. It can't help but be that way. Um, anytime you create a product, and I think board game designers feel this in their hearts, when I create it, it's a part of me, it's something I'm very proud of, but it also comes with all of the, the methods and even the bias that a board game designer might have. So also a little bit of context about the debate. Um, this, there is an existing debate. I'm sure that people have seen it in certain discussions, um, but sometimes the debate is assumed. And I think that in my literature review for this study, I found that the debate is less explicitly called upon as much as it is referenced to. Um, in Perla's penultimate work, there's a sentence, war games are more of an art than a science. Um, and I think that the artistic camp of war games would say that that's because you have an immersive player experience. You have so many creative elements. Um, Ms. Bartels did a fantastic survey of professional gamers in 2017 that really, I think, supported this side of the debate where participants favored art. They were using terms like player enjoyment that indicate a more artistic approach to design and execution of war games. About the same time, you have people on the other side of the aisle who favor the scientific element of war gaming, and this traditionally is because it evokes more credibility to DOD sponsors, if you can say, this was systematically done with a scientific approach. Um, and I think we see in a lot of articles that tend to favor science, pinpointing a lack of reliable training tools, a lack of agreed upon evaluation metrics, and, a, and sort of a chaotic literature pool that prevents the consolidation of knowledge. And if you point to those three pathologies of the community, you could say, those are all symptoms of this not being a scientific community and we need to move that direction. So both sides of the debate stand firm. But I would like to note that this isn't just a theoretical and academic debate. It's all well and good to say, we need to define the discipline of the wargaming community because it's important to understand it in theory. That's true, but when you place this debate in the larger chaos of wargame design, and we look at a common issue, which is how wargames are understood by sponsors, it becomes incredibly critical to say this is an art or this is a science because it affects decisions like how useful is this game? In what ways is it useful? Are war games even the right tool to answer? Um, is this to answer the question being asked? And especially I think in this climate where we're seeing you know, the NDS and the Government Accountability Office reports pointing to a revamp of joint analysis and a strengthening of the analytical arm of DOD, this is something that war gamers need to decide upon now so that we have a stronger position when presenting our tool in the future. So how did I go about doing this? Um, I relied mostly on a literature-based research approach, um, but at essence, in its core, my research methodology is a cross-examination, and it's sort of captured by this table. You can see science and art, the two main categories, and then for each of these, I plan to extrapolate traits the main traits that make a science discipline a science discipline and also for art. And I chose to focus on design standard of practices and evaluation standard of practices for the wargaming community with the plan of cross-examining those with the traits identified for sciences and arts. And the reason I chose to look at standards of practice rather than in products was because I believe that the standards of practice would be a better indicator of what I coined guild bias or the unofficial tradition that the community espouses. Um, standards of practice reveal the decisions being made that goes into the production of the end product itself. And while you can look at an end product and you can study it and you can say, oh, well, I guess, you know, this, this adjudication method is incredibly scientific. It's not as clear cut for the particular question I was trying to answer, but it would make a really interesting follow on study. So what is the issue that the guild faces? Um, I wanna really back up this idea of guild bias that I've just presented, and I'm gonna do that by answering three large questions. The first is how does the community know that a war game is successful? The really basic answer is that a good war game meets objectives, the purpose and the utility set forth by its designers and its sponsors. This is probably what happens at a pragmatic level, but it's not really 
a complete answer and it's certainly not a standardized evaluation metric. A more comprehensive answer to knowing whether or not a game is successful can be found in the individual practices of lots of different aspects of the wargaming community. Um, I turn to CNA's Wargame Pathologies, which harnesses game element analysis to break wargames down into elements and examine them for function and for failure modes. This was a really comprehensive and systematic way to study whether or not a game was successful, but it is also largely anecdotal because it is the product of the very community which is doing the evaluating of itself. It's kind of like, I know a war game is successful because it looks like a war game. These are the traits that I use to design a war game and if it has them, it's successful. Um, and in dialogue with specific elements, you know, there's a lot of other works that say, hey, you know, works like Wargaming Pathologies doesn't address this particular issue. Um, and so it, is, it can't be a complete picture because Wargaming is still an evolving field and it doesn't have a standard practice. And I think that that becomes, it's important for me to note out at this point that bias isn't necessarily a bad thing. It depends. If Wargaming is a science, then this would be very worrying that we don't have a specific set standardized way to tell whether something is successful. But if wargaming is truly an art, then it's okay as long as we're transparent. When you think about how art is produced, whether or not it's successful is often in the eye of the beholder. So the answer to this question becomes very relevant. The second question, how is a successful wargame achieved? And here I looked at two particular case studies. The first was CNA, and I looked at the evolution of wargaming literature from CNA from 1987 to 2004 with the wargame construction kit. And I was looking at what sort of the existing practices were for designing a game. Um, and I found that there was a slight evolution from designing the game to developmenting it and sort of with the purpose of teaching how to design into the future. And then the second was the study of mini guilds from RAND's Next Generation Wargaming through the US Marine Corps, which did an excellent job of surveying um, different practices across the community. And I found a lot of intellectual variety um, in the collection of tools and approaches. Um, there is sort of a unique collaborative structure and knowledge was cumulative. But not knowing whether or not wargaming is squarely art or science here, again, is an issue because it prevents making appropriate recommendations for how both of those case studies and how the community itself organizes and talks about its relationship to each other. Okay, and then what keeps the guild from understanding its discipline? This is the third question. And I think it's important too, because it's all fine and good to say that, oh, there are problems, but then why? Why, why is it that we are where we are in this current state? Um, the first is an issue of internal norms and culture. Um, and again, I, I pulled a quote from, from Rubel here that um, we have all the components to make a discipline, um, but we don't necessarily have the will to do so, or we just haven't yet. Um, the second is an external culture. Um, there was an excellent study done by Hansen into the sort of prescribed root solutions that the military prefers, and how this sometimes can cripple innovation of working design. And third and finally, sponsor pressure. Um, and that doesn't have to be just sponsors, but anytime that you're making a war game for another party, there can be bureaucratic pressures as simple as time, money, and resources that can change the way that we work with games and can sort of take away from that time that you might need to be like, this project is an art and I'm going to do X or this project is a science and it's going to change the way I do this. A lot of times I feel that war game designers have to work against constraints to simply get the job done. Um, but if you have a situation where the success of a game is contingent on factors inside and outside of the community, understanding the tool can help um, cross, that, cross that void. So that's sort of the sum of the issue at hand. And at this time, I want to kind of zoom back out and do a bit of a theoretical discussion about what art and science disciplines are. And I would start by saying that art and science now is a lot different than art and science of, say, ancient Rome. Um, there is sort of the idea that Matt alluded to, the idea that they hold hands, that we're giving is both. That is an idea that comes out of the art science movement, one word, art science movement. Um, and the art science movement, I'm not saying it does not have value, but for the sake of this study, I wanted to look at what makes science and art different, acknowledging that they have a lot of overlap, 
and in some cases should be used together, but they're philosophical and at, in essence, their pragmatic differences are really what affects a field. Um, and I think that in our modern world, a lot of the, lit the literature revealed to me that science as we currently understand it is meant for processes that deal with deduction and art is meant for processes that deal with intuition. And you'll see that as we go through this section. So to study these, I went to two theoretical bodies of work. The first to turn to figure out the attributes of art and science, I, the first field was artistic research perspective. And the artistic research field is a really fascinating community that actually shares a lot of the same pathologies and sort of the state of development as the war gaming field. And second, I turned to the business perspective, um, sources like Harvard Business Review, to look at how art and science are really built in a very practical sense. The artistic research perspective, for those of you who aren't familiar with artistic research, I certainly wasn't before I started this journey. Artistic research is the systematic study of any creative process that goes into the production of objects, works, crafts, anything considered art. Um, this would be the systematic study of how ballet is performed or the systematic study of um, Picasso's works. Anything that you think of traditionally as an art form, this community of researchers is trying to figure out whether there are methods you can use to study those things when traditionally it's assumed that those objects cannot be studied because they are expressive. And as I said, they do share a lot of similarities with the wargaming community particularly because they self-described, um, face a lot of pressure to self-define um, and to sort of have this academic validity. They feel that they need to standardize some of their processes, but they're actively fighting against that because of their research. Um, science disciplines, I'd say my two big findings about science and art, and I'll break this down a little bit later, but the main takeaways is that science disciplines, according to the art artistic research field, have a tradition of self-maintenance and self-definition. And arts have a favor for transparency, individual creative processes. Um, stringent guidelines are sort of frowned upon as it runs a risk of impeding the ultimate product that you're looking at. And then second, the business perspective. Um, here, I just wanted to highlight the, the idea of process standardization. This is my biggest finding from the business perspective. And this is sort of going back to the idea of the Ford production line. Um, process standardization is when you, as a business, know that you need to get a thing done. It serves a single function. Um, and you apply the process to optimize the environment. It's agreed upon. It's validated. You know that it works. It produces something that you can expect every single time that meets customer requirements. So the finding from this is that if you have a process that rejects any of the traits of process standardization, it's probably more of an art. Science tends to, con to confirm to process standardization. It's replicable. You can repeat any science experiment. Art is not that way. Um, and the two main variables that determine that dichotomy are one, the level of variability in the environment, and two, the output variation that creates customer value. And I think that second point is particularly interesting. If you are going to commission an art piece, you want it to be unique. You're not looking necessarily for a print that's been reproduced eight times, 800 times. Um, and that is a really very tangible way of distinguishing between art and science. So this is a lot of text and I'm gonna distill it down, but what you can see here is the results of my distillation of the science and art disciplines. Um, the traits of the disciplines, I chose eight that seemed the most common and reoccurring in the literature. We have community tradition, treatment of bias, validity, innate philosophical character, treatment of humans, the phases of study as described by field experts, you'll see that those are in direct quotes, the level of variability and the value and uniqueness and results and products. Um, and if we have time, we can go back to this if there are any questions and talk about what those exact differences look like. But you can take a moment to scan the table here and see those differences. And this, not to jump too much, is the results. So how I got from this table to this table is I went back to all of the initial literature review that I did examining all of the bodies of works that I could find from the wargaming community itself, which was a little tricky because we have a very chaotic literature pool. 
to break down what our design SOPs are, our evaluation SOPs, to highlight the issues, to highlight the standards, and then to take the other two bodies of literature, cross the two, and do some good old-fashioned text analysis to figure out whether or not they aligned more strongly with art or science. All of these pink blocks aligned more with art and the blue science. Um, and what's really interesting about this is the more pink blocks you have, the more you can say the field lines towards art. So I was able to conclude from this examination that at present, the standards of procedure of design and evaluation in the wargaming community are much more strongly art. And I would dare say the wargaming community and designing a war game is an art. It is an art as an academic discipline. If it were to become a standardized academic discipline, it would be an art. And that has a lot of implications, um, some which may seem obvious once I start to unpack them, and some which were a little bit more finer point. Um, but what's exciting is that this, this proves right um, Perlow's original statement that wargaming is more of an art than a science. And that's really exciting. And I think that it's something that I hope will soak a lot of conversation going forward. Immediate takeaways. I'm guessing that for many of you in the audience, these findings really are not that surprising because wargaming is a very creative thing. When you're producing a game, when you're playing a game, at both sides of the game development and execution, it feels fun and creative. It looks like an art. It's a product in a box. It can be reprinted, but the original copy is something that comes from the designer themselves. There are, going ahead to head up um, some conversation that may come with this, there are scientific elements present and integrated into gaming. And I don't think that that runs contrary to this finding. I think that science and art can hold hands as long as we recognize that the very basis of designing a game in terms of its process and how we evaluate it has to comply with it being an artistic discipline. And particularly for this conference, as we talk about artificial intelligence, this becomes particularly relevant um, as we can integrate it. And it also concludes that guild bias is present in these processes. But it's important for me to note that even though bias, again, has a negative connotation, because the field is an art, bias is a good thing. Um, bias means that people have independent approaches to game design and that those beliefs can be captured in a really unique way. But it also means that transparency is incredibly important if we're going to push the field forward. So what does this mean? I'm going to break this down, the implications by researchers, designers, and then finally sponsors. For researchers, people like myself who really enjoy delving into the theoretical side of wargaming, this means that this would be the time for us to integrate the disciplinary understanding that wargaming is an art into descriptions of what wargames are. That includes metrics, that includes in writing. It, 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 this, I hope that my research allows a more substantive backing to the declaration that wargaming is more of an art than a science. Um, but we also may take this as a point to formalize literature sharing to move the field forward. And I think that having an academic discipline to tie all of this together can help us do that. And that might include um, creating a wargaming specific journal. There are lots of fantastic platforms already there. But sometimes academic disciplines benefit from having a single point where a lot of the literature sharing happens. Um, and that's been brought up by multiple speakers already in this conference. So I just want to echo that idea. For the designers, um, processes used to design games should not be homogenized. And I want to make that particularly clear. I think a lot of people would agree. Um, but if war games and the process of designing them are art processes, then homogenizing parts of the war game design process is to our detriment. Also, we have implications for the metrics that we use to evaluate success. My findings for our disciplines by and large were that evaluation metrics are sort of based on the customer that is receiving the art. If you commission a piece and then you get a piece of art back that matches your commission, whether or not it was successful on the artist's Part and their design process was successful is based on my happiness because I commissioned the piece. Um, and then finally, uh, this also has implications for designing the next generation of designers. Um, considering what baseline components are necessary to become a good war game designer in an artistic field is critical. And I think you find, if you think about how arts are taught in university, you can think of studio time, you can think of studying historical arts, but you also want to build their individual as a student um, skills at designing something unique to them. So I think that that's really important for the community to consider.
And finally, I promise this is the final slide before we open the floor for questions. Um, I broke down sponsors plus <laughs> into sponsors, players, results users, and decision makers. And I really wanna spend some time on these particular implications. For sponsors, I know I saw this in the chat a little bit. I would also like to buy the t-shirt. Um, so what is your objective? Um, because I think it's a critical question, this, particularly for sponsors. If wargaming is an art, if the design process is an art, Sponsors need to be aware of that when they decide that that is something that they want to answer the questions that they have. And it also means that war games might not always be the right solution. For players, there can be a greater understanding of the importance and impact that they have in the game. Engaging with a war game, if it is an artistic process, means that they carry a lot of weight themselves and are also participating in an art. And for results, users understanding the nature of war game design and the limits of its nature places you places limitations on the utility of results and how it can be used and what conclusions can be extrapolated. Um, and then finally for decision makers, and I think that this is a cautionary tale as well, just because war game design processes are arts, it doesn't mean that war game is any less, less valid. I think we find often that it can be particularly a good selling point if you can show that there are you know, numbers or there's more scientific methods integrated into war game design, but that runs in the face of the idea that war games are not predictive, but simply help you think through a process or an idea and present possibilities. And I think that showing that this is an art can help back up that statement, but we also have to do a lot of work on our end to start an awareness campaign that shows, hey, war games aren't necessarily a quantitative and scientific tool. They can have them integrated in that, but still, this product is valuable just the way it is in its current form as an artistic discipline. So with that, I have my two bodies of sources and uh, over, over for questions. Outstanding, great presentation. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, Nate, I think you're gonna be very busy with questions. I, uh, uh, this has always uh, stimulated a lot of comments. I have a feeling, uh, especially today. Thank you very much. Yes, get a drink of water now. You may not have time. Go ahead, Nate. Thanks, Matt. So, Sawyer, I, I know a lot of these questions are important, but I think the big one to start with, is your thesis published and available anywhere? Um, interestingly enough, I just got an email from the Georgetown librarian saying that it is available, but the, the title is present in the Georgetown records, but the file itself is not attached. Um, so I've been following up with my master's program to figure out why that is. I would like to make it available through the Georgetown Library, but also that's, you know, I want it to be available to more people than just Georgetown patrons. Um, but I'm looking for, for platforms to, to include it, and I'd be, I'd, I feel happy to distribute it to anyone who wants to email me, and I'll put my email um, in the chat at the end of this. But I, I think that this kind of goes back to my point, is there one place we don't have as a discipline something equivalent to like a nature journal um, where you can see all of the new really pertinent theoretical research coming out in one place. And so I would like to make that more available to anyone. But yes, I'll, I'll put my email in the chat. Please feel free to email me and I will 100% send you my thesis. Perfect. Yeah, and I know one of the places I always think of for uh, posting recent information is uh, PACSIMS, but as you said, uh, we can continue to consolidate rather than uh, having the several ones that are out there. So next, why did you approach the research question from analysis of war games rather than the war gamers, uh, i.e. are established war gamers achievements and credentials based predominantly on their education and writings or experience in design? So as such, is war gaming a profession or a trade craft? Yes, that's a really good question. And when I was going through the iterations of designing my research methodology, my first instinct was to make it an ethnographic study of the community and to go out and conduct discussions and interviews and make it a study of the individuals because I felt that that would be very pertinent to the guild. Um, it became an issue of, of time and resources primarily. Um, I had four months to complete all of my research and documentation and writing um, for this project. And I, I think I put I may have indicated in an initial note that that would be a lovely follow-up study that I would like to do to further these results. Um, but I did choose to focus on the standards of procedure as exemplified by the literature rather than wargaming in 
products. Um, and I acknowledged in my limitations, which I don't think I had time to touch on during the presentation itself, but he, I had to acknowledge that sometimes the descriptions of standards of practices um, that are on paper will deviate from practices in real life. Um, and so that's a limitation of my study that I think talking to um, everyone in the community and having sort of a full ethnographic style study would remedy. Um, so I, I would like to, to have, I would love to <laughs> have another academic journey down that rabbit hole in the future, um, but it was not within the scope of this study. Perfect. Uh, the standard reward for good work is more work. Um, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so, so would a transition uh, from guild to profession tip your eval evaluation metrics towards science rather than art? Not necessarily. Um, I think that standardizing a field is a broad thing and it can be dangerous to say we're going to standardize everything. Um, as I said in the implications for designers, a homogeny in design and probably in evaluation too um, is dangerous. However, I do think that there are some things that can be standardized that are traditional of an academic discipline regardless of art and science, say having a, a single place for literature, um, having more conferences like Connections. Connections is a, a check mark for being an academic discipline. Um, you have a place where scholars come together and talk, and I think that Connections is so absolutely important for that reason. I probably would not have written this thesis if I hadn't been in the audience of, next, of the last Connections with my notebook going, oh, well, that's an interesting question. Maybe I should investigate that. Um, so I think that that knowledge sharing is really critical, and I think finding standardized or form, formalized ways to perpetuate something that looks like a very cohesive field, something that could even be a discipline, say, at a university, not that you necessarily need a degree in war game design, um, but that it is a very tangible element. I think we start to see that in universities today. Georgetown is one of them, King's College, London, I mean, the list goes on, McGill. Um, but I don't think that standardizing things like actually, like the design process itself is necessary per the findings of my study. And I actually think it would be to our detriment to do that. Hopefully I answered the question. Yeah, um, actually just kind of a follow up with that. What implications do your finding of wargaming as an art and thus with guild-like structure have on the current desire to embrace diversity inclusivity? Uh, is that helping us? Is it, you know, is there something specific we should take from that? I think that if anything, these findings support wholeheartedly the idea that we need to include diversity and inclusion and the Derby House principles. Uh, because art is in a very, very, very thousand foot view is about finding ways to express to people across diverse ranges of age, ethnicity, ac academic background, whatever label or cross cutting um, sector you want to put people in. Art is supposed to reach across those boundaries. And I think that in a really, really anecdotal and practical way, outside of my study, we can see that in a, in a room, wargaming is inherently social. And it does a really good job, if it's done well, of making those barriers between people fall away. Um, and it sort of suspends reality and allows us to play. And I think that having diversity and inclusion in the field um, is really in the true spirit of it being an artistic discipline. I couldn't agree more. Um, so I know we've got a lot of people saying it was a great analysis of the art versus science. Um, and following that up, have you examined the idea of the wargaming discipline as a multidisciplinary field, uh, one where excellence requires a combination of artistic, scientific, engineering knowledge? Uh, and then I think along with that, um, wargaming, you know, war knowledge. Yeah, that's interesting. I think I, I might want to ask a little bit more. Do you mean if, if wargaming is an artistic discipline and then it has sub-disciplines within it and so the literature would also be broken down and practice would also be broken down by those categories? Or do you mean simply that having it be an artistic discipline includes all of those things? Because it certainly does. Maybe I'm not understanding the question. I'm gonna wait and see if they post a clarification to okay. that. Um, That's good. And we'll move on to the next one. If so, it's helpful, uh, before there is, I do have a slight answer to, to what I think I'm getting at. Um, another limitation of my study, and I know I'm spelling out all the limitations, but that's, that's good analysis, right? Um, is that I had to really blow up and extrapolate science and art as disciplines. Um, when you go to a university, you don't get like 
you do get a master's of science or a master's of arts, but you have a subdiscipline within it, right? Like my master's was security studies. Um, and I didn't choose a particular subdiscipline of science or art for this study because I didn't want wargaming to be compared to just one field or just one specific uh, other craft. I thought it was better to get really high into the weeds of the theory um, to figure out at a broad and inherent level where wargaming sat rather than to do a cross-examination of say wargame design and computer design or engineering or anything like that. Although again, you, you could do follow-up studies that would examine it against other fields that create particular crafts and products. I think that would be super interesting to take war games and maybe the actual in products rather than the standard of design and to compare the in products with the in products of those other fields and try to say, ah, oh, does wargaming share more in common with like this piano made by piano makers or with this gadget made by um, Apple or, and, and what does that say? Um, so we could, you know, have thousands of studies that stem from this, and I would very much like to see that. <laughs> yeah, that interdisciplinary approach always brings in more. Um, one of the questions with that thought it, uh, that sticks out to me is, have you been involved uh, in the art world? Because uh, the comment is that the debate you're presenting is very close to those in the art community. Interestingly, I, I have not. Um, I'm not a very artistic person. Um, inherently, I, my academic background is in military history and operational level analysis um, and international politics. I'm more of a political science than anything. Um, and in terms of hobbies, I think the most artistic I get is being a drummer, um, which, which it is an art, but um, is certainly not something that I do professionally. Um, so I'd like to say that as much as possible, I came at this from a very objective level because I did not favor one side science or art over the other um, based on my own experience. Uh, however, with any sort of research, it is, you know, especially because wargaming, as we found, is an artistic discipline, um, it can be difficult to make it totally objective. Um, and that, again, is a limitation. It's not a science experiment. Makes sense. Um, so if designing war games are more art than science, following the theme of the conference, would this limit the possibility for AI to design war games in the future? Bearing in mind that I am not an expert on artificial intelligence, from what I do know about it, I would be very cautious um, because I think that so much of the value of war game design, um, if you see value and uniqueness and results of product, so much of the value in a war game is that it comes from the designer and that designers and different mini guilds as Rand called them um, have different cultures and norms of their own and different ways that they like to produce these products. I think that turning over a lot of that process to AI would perhaps stymie the creativity that is so valuable to the field and maybe even make the field into something different than it currently is. If war games can be produced by artificial intelligence does that retract the value from the designers themselves? Particularly if you think about how great game designers come to be. It's years of experience and trial and error and this apprenticeship model of education where um, that I'm experiencing right now, you know, looking for mentors in my workplace and in academia to give me opportunities so that I can observe how they design games and how I can form my own methods for designing my own games. Um, I think that a lot of that would be called into question if the process was turned over to artificial intelligence. That's not to say, however, that you couldn't harness the skills of an artificial intelligence into your own artistic design process. Um, using AI for things like adjudication is not contrary to these findings because even art incorporates science. You can think about the Met or the Museum of Modern Art. You could think about all kinds of different institutions where art is present that incorporates electricity and other elements of science. Um, it's all about the inherent theoretical basis for the skill and for the field. I, I think that's a, a pretty good place for, you know, what we know of the current capabilities of AI today uh, as well. Um, to follow, and I think it, it pairs well with some clarification I got from an earlier one, um, that you can't be a great war game creator, designer, developer without some understanding 
of all these different disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the science and art side of understanding war, geography, history, statistics, engineering, storytelling. Um, do you think that's a, an accurate premises? Is it, is it true or false to say that you actually need that sort of interdisciplinary approach? I would say that having that interdisciplinary approach is a lot of pressure to put on one person. Um, and personally, and, and this is um, a, just a personal opinion of mine being in the field, I think that war games really could benefit from design teams um, because you do put more minds together with more expertise to create a product. And it's, it's my experience and a lot of the design thinking literature proves this idea that um, an idea is better when a bunch of minds get into a room and say, I like that, yes, and, rather than, but. And they, they start to build an idea that gets big and only then apply the limitations of reality to bake it down into something that actually becomes an end product. Um, so I would say that integrating all of those different disciplines into design by hiring and looking for and recruiting diverse minds and diverse academic disciplines in your war game designers is a really good way to address this. Um, and I think that it's right to say that all those different disciplines add value to war games. And I think it gets back to the central argument as well. Um, if this is an artistic discipline, then it doesn't really matter what your academic background or history is. You can still have a creative moment and produce something that is a craft. If this were a science, you could almost imagine an argument where everyone would need to have a degree in war game design. You can't very well be a molecular biologist if you didn't get a degree in biology. Or, I mean, you can pass certain levels of credentials and certificates and, and follow certain guidelines to do that, but the wargaming field doesn't really work that way. I know that Moores has a wargaming certificate, and I think that that has some value, um, but I don't know that wargaming is something that needs to, while I think it should have academic disciplinary validity, it should be something that is considered a field, I don't know that it's necessarily something that you should have a degree in in and of itself. I, li I like that answer. It sounds good to me. Um, we've got a couple more questions, but we've got time for one more. Uh, and I, I think there's some room for you to, to discuss it um, because I'm sure it'll be of interest to the crowd. Uh, are you going to be doing more wargaming research? It sounds like yes. Um, but what would you like to do? What are you planning to do? Um, you know, what can we expect to see next? Well, gosh, um, what can you expect to see next? Well, I'm at the Center for Naval Analysis and I really, really love um, working there. I've only been there for a month because I just graduated uh, this past May. Um, so I'm hoping to develop my skills as an operational research analyst um, primarily and a, a war game designer as well um, while I'm there, kind of grow up at CNA. Um, and then also with my new appointment as a fellow for the United States Naval Academy, I'm hoping to I'm still mulling around what question I'm going to address, um, but I'm hoping to conduct sort of like a year long um, secondary research project. And I'm kind of using this connections conference just like I did last summer as my platform um, to think about all the different things I'd like to address. But the concepts that fascinate me most are the ones that pertain to the community itself. Um, how we work, how we think, um, how we think about design. I'm really interested in war gamers as they are members of an organization and informal connections. I'm interested in connections. <laughs> um, so I, I think you can imagine that my research will tend to fall in that general category as I go forward. Outstanding. Well, Nate, you were up to the challenge uh, as, as expected. We had lots of questions, lots of really good questions. And, uh, uh, so we had lots of really good answers and a very, very good presentation. Uh, my vote for your next research effort would be comparing wargaming and architecture. Oh, that would be cool. That would be really cool. I'll write that one down. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk. I had a really great time today. Well, uh, you're, you're more than welcome. Thank you. And uh, see everybody in 15 minutes.